Thank you, Edward, and I was full of admiration for the way you kept us on time yesterday and uh, summarized things, and hopefully I can do some of the same things today. I wanted to start out with the um, definitions, and I think we have, um, we put them on a slide because that would make it easier. Um, and first of all, the intimate partner violence uh, definition, which um, we remind you is, is what we're mainly focusing on. Um, in this workshop, and it refers to, to behavior by an intimate partner or ex-partner that causes physical, sexual, or psychological harm, including physical aggression, sexual coercion, psychological abuse, and controlling behaviors. And this is from the World Health Organization. Um, then sometimes yesterday we slipped into gender-based violence um, a language, and so there was some confusion about the difference between the two. Um, and this is from uh, the UN, um, and it's gender-based violence refers to abuse that results in or is likely to result in physical, sexual, or psychological harm or suffering to women, including threats of such acts, coercion, or arbitrary deprivation of liberty, whether occurring in public or in private life. So gender-based violence is a wider definition. Um, and then for many of us, and oftentimes for the public, we may refer to domestic violence, and that is a term that's oftentimes used here and, and oftentimes used um, in many other parts of the world. Um, and, and most people think they're referring to something like intimate partner violence, although domestic violence makes it occur in the home, et cetera, and so forth. So it's less precise of a term than is intimate partner violence. Um, but oftentimes for the public, when you say intimate partner violence, um, they look at you like, what are you talking about? And domestic violence is a um, more colloquial, more publicly accessible term. So you find people um, using various terms when they're meaning the same thing. And um, I think one of the things we talked about yesterday is the, the necessity of being precise when we're talking in terms of evidence, so that we're precise about what we're um, talking about and what it refers to. Uh, then some of the other general themes from yesterday, and um, I know that it's impossible in 10 minute overview to refer to everything that was said. There was many important things were said. All of it's been recorded, um, but I just tried to, uh, with Rachel's help, uh, consolidate into some major themes. And first of all, we heard first off about the substantial prevalence of intimate partner violence in this region. We have good data from several different sources. Um, it is incredibly persuasive that there are high rates of intimate partner violence in this region. So that's well established. Um, it's also well established that it's a serious health problem. And including particularly yesterday, we, we talked about the connections with HIV AIDS. Um, and we were persuaded by the most recent evidence from a meta-analysis that Dr. Watts told us about that actually used cohort or prospective studies um, to, that are very persuasive in um, establishing that there is indeed a link of intimate partner violence and HIV AIDS, um, and that that data is more current, um, more recent, um, than some of the other data that was um, talked about um, from the DHS that was cross-sectional. And it's very important that the data that Dr. Watts was talking about is prospective, is cohort, studies um, and is more recent, including data from um, here in Uganda in Rakai. Um, one of the other things we heard about yesterday is how those pathways to HIV are complex, multi-directional, and on many different levels, both behavioral and physiological. So, you know, both between the couple, um, within the individual uh, uh, victim of intimate partner violence, um, and also, uh, very importantly, mediated by what's happening in the community and what's possible for women. 
The consequences of IPV uh, we heard about in terms of being very far reaching, including effects on children, and both in terms of the toxic stress of the environment for children and the kinds of effects that may well have, as well as the effects of um, oftentimes co-occurring uh, child abuse, child sexual abuse, as well as witnessing intimate partner violence in one's home growing up. Um, another theme that was very important was that in order for us to make recommendations to policymakers, we have to articulate clear messages and they need to be supported by data. Um, and uh, another theme that's related to that is the value of comparing data and sharing best, best practices in this region. Um, that hearing from uh, the, the several countries that we have here and within those countries, different regions of those countries, it's very important that we're sharing best practices and we're, very, we're thrilled to have people from all three countries um, being here. We also, one of the best practices that was talked about um, is screening for intimate partner violence um, in various settings, healthcare settings, not just to identify victims, uh, but to link them with services, um, and importantly, services that the person wants, that she wants, um, versus imposing different solutions on someone. Um, and also that the importance of uh, both a safe exit, if that is what, um, and, and I love that terminology that, that Jesse shared with us, um, a safe exit if that's what she wants, um, but also other services that are available in the community. Um, various empowerment, economic resources, um, and importantly, as we'll hear today, the importance of both individual um, approaches to women um, in various sectors where they may appeal for help, um, but also the screening to help them come forward um, perhaps earlier than they would have already. Um, we heard um, about the, the careful development and testing of screening practices in Kenya, um, which helped um, us underscore the fact that we can't just import strategies from other parts of the world but we need to look at them within a local context and really carefully test them and amass the evidence uh, that they're useful there. Um, the importance of the multi-sectorial approach um, was emphasized over and over again, um, and what was, in terms of the workshop objectives, um, the synergies that are possible when we have a meeting like this to hear from each other and think about, well, how can we both collaborate uh, with a program in another um, part of this region, um, and how can we learn from what was done there? Um, what of that do we need to do again to make sure it's locally um, relevant, or what can we accept in terms of evidence um, from the other place? Um, and the, um, importance of both addressing needs of individual survivors or those um, affected by intimate partner violence in terms of, as I mentioned, safe exits, empowerment, and also economic resources being an important part of that, but changing gender norms also. The importance of getting men involved in this process, um, uh, both as um, occasionally um, survivors of intimate partner violence, but importantly getting men involved in changing those gender norms and in changing the behaviors of individual men. The importance of local leaders um, as well as other levels of society in that process. Um, and that's very much what, uh, part of what we're going to be hearing today. Um, is uh, both strategies to address this from many different sectors as well as um, strategies that both address gender norms as well as needs of individual survivors. So it's a really good bridge to what we're going to hear today. 
and Edward's going to talk a little bit about what we want you to be thinking about, you and the audience, as well as the participants, um, as we go forward to that important um, panel at the end of the day, when we're going to actually articulate some of the other uh, possibilities for moving forward.